very pleased to uh, welcome you to our Urban Growth Seminar Series uh, for 2010-2011 uh, uh, academic year. Uh, we do that every year. We do about six uh, seminars each semester. We will take a little more or less. Um, <clears throat> and uh, usually, uh, or always, it's on Tuesday at this time of the uh, day from 12.15 to 1.30. Uh, and uh, the dates, of course, uh, will vary. So, but before I introduce our uh, speakers today, uh, I'd like to point out that on September 14th, uh, we'll have Professor Dana Cuff from UCLA School of Architecture. Uh, and then on uh, October 12th, uh, Robert Riley, uh, who is a uh, visiting professor at law school here. And uh, on November 9th, uh, Stephanos Polizaitis, who is uh, the principal of Polizaitis Rules, um, associate based in Pasadena, and a major uh, uh, kind of uh, pioneer in the area of new urbanism, he's going to uh, give a talk. And we have two others uh, that we're working on. We haven't quite um, settled them yet. Um, we're very fortunate to have the uh, session very first week of the semester, because it usually takes us a week to kind of get organized. And we thank our panelists for being available, all three of them being available here today. Um, the, um, I'm not going to spend too much time going through their bio, for one, I don't have that with me. And secondly, I know them very well, and you know them too. So, uh, uh, Professor Richard Little uh, on the extreme right, on my extreme, your extreme right, is uh, uh, the director of the Keston Center for Infrastructure. A man who is well known in the field of infrastructure, infrastructure financing, internationally, domestically. And um, so uh, he heads our uh, Keston Infrastructure Institute here, and he often frequent participant in these workshops. Uh, in the middle, Professor Eric Hekala, uh, who has been here for quite some time. Uh, not quite as long as, but uh, halfway. No, not halfway. More than halfway. Uh, Professor Hekala uh, is uh, uh, <coughs> also the director of the, uh, the school's uh, uh, global initiatives uh, uh, programs. Uh, he is a uh, person. Uh, internationally well known for his uh, work on comparative urbanization, urban development, um, and he teaches courses in related areas here. Uh, professor Hilda Blanco, uh, the research professor here. Uh, she's also the director of the Center for Sustainable Cities. Uh, professor Blanco, who recently was at the University of Washington, uh, to our uh, benefit from our move here, and she's now a, a distinguished member of our faculty. And uh, this panel is based on uh, uh, some work that was done, was invited by the uh, mayor of Fortune uh, City uh, on, a, on a round table forum that was uh, organized by the Pacific Rift Council of Urban Development. This is a group that actually Professor Hekala has been Actually, I was the the beginning uh, in Taipei when the group was uh, initiated, um, and Professor Hegel has been uh, uh, very much involved in uh, organizing that council and nurturing that council through the years. And they go from different city to city every summer at the invitation of uh, a host a country, a host city, and they do this workshop focusing on the problems of that particular country and city. So in this instance, this summer, they looked at the, uh, the Im impact of climate change on Ho Chi Minh City was a theme, and uh, they, along with other participants, worked on it. So we're very happy to hear from them um, the findings of that seminar and the workshop. So with that, uh, uh, I need it over to the I was told I don't need to touch any of the microphones. So thank you, Trita. Uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, 
climate change adaptation in Ho Chi Minh City. And this was a quite an interesting experience for me, and I'll, I'll assume for my, my two colleagues on the panel, but, but they'll get to tell you about their part. Uh, we're, we're broken down, uh, like Gaul, into uh, three parts. Uh, I get the easy piece, which is the background and, and overview. And then Professor Hikola will go into some adaptation strategies for climate change, which I think you'll find quite interesting. And then last but not least, uh, some specific solutions that we discussed uh, while we were there. Uh, first, a little bit about what PRCUD is, uh, and don't try to read all these words. Uh, basically, it's a network of international academics and practitioners who have an interest in urban problems. Uh, and usually on an annual basis, uh, PRCUD members, not all of them, and it's not a membership organization, but members within the network, come together to address a specific urban development problem uh, in a city surrounding uh, the Pacific Rim region. Uh, we basically function through what we call the Roundtable Forum. And I don't know if you can read the little letters as I reduce this down to fit on the slide. Uh, going back from the late 80s, there were a series of conferences that were held. And then beginning in 1998, the Roundtable Forum format was begun, and you can see where this has been, places as exotic as Long Beach. Uh, but after that, uh, we went to more settled places, uh, Malacca, Palembang, uh, Nanjing, I believe, uh, Zhangzhou in Korea, Jakarta, uh, Siem Reap in Cambodia. Last year, uh, we went to Foshan, China. This year, we went to Ho Chi Minh City, always to address a specific problem that's worked out in advance with uh, the, the host of the Roundtable Forum. Uh, this year, we, we had a, a rather lengthy charge, and that was to deal with urban planning and development responses to climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is the Saigon River here, shorefront. Uh, what I found is particularly for coastal cities in Asia, they take sea level rise very seriously, only because they, they have so little freeboard in which to work. And, and this is a very serious issue. Uh, we were asked to come in and deal with two specific issues that will uh, be discussed by my uh, colleagues. One is the Heap Falk, and if I mispronounce that, I apologize, port urban area, uh, which is twofold. There's a proposal to move the major port in Ho Chi Minh City to the Heap Falk area, basically to take advantage of deeper water and the ability to move cargo containers uh, a little bit more readily. And the other area, Oh, and together with the port area, there's a proposal to develop a corresponding industrial area and a new town, if you will, to support uh, the industrial and port activities, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. The other was District 6, which is an older, very heavily developed uh, portion of Ho Chi Minh City. Primarily, it's the old uh, Chinatown section of the city, uh, although not uh, so clearly ethnically divided today. Uh, both these areas are very subject to flooding. And the thing is, uh, they don't have to wait for climate change and sea level rise because they flood very readily now. Uh, they have major problems with drainage. Uh, whenever it rains, uh, as you'll see from some of the photos. And climate change and sea level rise, storm surge, are only going to exacerbate these problems. So they're quite concerned uh, about what they can do and what approaches they should take. 
Uh, just to give you some idea, uh, these were the five specific issues or the way we organized the roundtable forum uh, to look at this. One was an overview of Heap Falk. The other was to discuss flooding issues, flooding issues in District 6, and then some urban revitalization and socioeconomic issues, which I won't go into in detail. This is the new port. As you can see, they've constructed uh, a modern container port facility. It's run by uh, Dubai Ports. Uh, so there's an international player in this. Uh, this is pretty much what the area where they're going to build the new industrial complex and new town looks like. Uh, not on the river, but immediately adjacent is very low-lying mangrove swamp, uh, which is going to be a development challenge in any regard, and if you imagine sea level anywhere from several inches to several meters higher, uh, they're going to have to take this into account. Uh, this is after a pretty standard afternoon, I won't even call it storm, I'll call it rain shower. This was probably a 30 minute storm, and this is what the streets look like all the time after it rains. They just don't have any way to convey the water away. Uh, looking at some of the urban development issues, you can see what's, uh, this is one of the major drainage canals. Uh, they haven't been particularly well maintained, and one of the problems Ho Chi Minh City has really lost in some areas the traditional connection that the Vietnamese have always had uh, with the water. And so one of the things that we had talked about was the need for them to take that into account in their planning and try to integrate the water very closely into their land use schemes, but also how they uh, deal with climate change impacts. And last but not least, some of the socioeconomic issues. This is District 6, as you can see, uh, probably not the... Uh, Probably you won't see that in a highlight reel of uh, the best in urban areas. Very densely developed, very haphazardly developed. And again, uh, as you can see here, whenever there's flooding, the water comes right up to the, the edge, inundating uh, the first floor. So it, it's very difficult to think about what kind of development is going to be appropriate for these areas uh, because they, they already are inundated whenever there's a storm. Plus, we have to think about what's coming down the road. Uh, I went the wrong way. Okay, uh, just to set a little bit of context, and uh, Professor Blanco will go into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, this is Ho Chi Minh City, the Saigon River here. This is uh, District 1, which is sort of the uh, downtown, if you will, uh, particularly of old when it was Saigon. Uh, this is where most of the hotels uh, are located. They've moved the port up here. Uh, that is a, a, is a done deal. They, we weren't asked whether they should move the port. We were asked to comment on that. And then District 6 is over here. Uh, this is a uh, blow-up uh, map of the port area. You can see this is the port itself. Uh, to the north, they've proposed the industrial area, and then a, a large swath of this is planned uh, as an urban uh, area with commercial and residential uses. Uh, and, and you'll hear more about that from Professor Blanco. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we do uh, at these forums, I've taken some of the wilder scenes out. But uh, <laughs> you can see uh, this is uh, the, the mayor. Uh, of Ho Chi Minh City. This is uh, one of our members, uh, Cord de Graaf. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion uh, from all sides. We had approximately 100 people uh, from uh, Vietnam, various parts, uh, with ministries, the private sector, uh, who came to this, participated, asked questions, raised issues. It's very much an interactive dialogue uh, between the members of PRCUD. Uh, this was our group here. Uh, and the local inhabitants. So it's not we just come in and take information, go off and write a report. It's a very interactive uh, 
sort of activity. And with that, I would like to pass the baton to Professor Hikola and let him tell you about some strategies for dealing with climate change. Thank you. This one is... So, the case of Ho Chi Minh City is one case study that we were engaged uh, with sort of up close and personal, but the issue of climate change and uh, inundation and adaptation to that uh, by cities is something that's being experienced by cities around the world, both here in the United States, uh, as we've uh, learned uh, painfully in the case of New Orleans, and um, again, elsewhere around the world. And the area of South Asia, Southeast Asia, parts of China, are experiencing, and uh, Philippines is experiencing this in a fairly dramatic way. Ho Chi Minh City uh, has been uh, seen as, as being on the leading edge. It's a very low rise, very low rise, um, very low lying city with 60% uh, of the topography one meter or less above sea level. So there's just not much uh, not much give. As you've seen from some of the photos, it's very, f very flat, and uh, as, as the water begins to rise, whether it's through storm surges, rainfall, uh, sea level rise, uh, there's, just very, there's just very little give. And this is representative of a number of other cities um, around the world. So part of our task was to not only formulate uh, advice for Ho Chi Minh City, but also try to think about draw on experiences from elsewhere uh, where they've been confronting similar issues and think about how those lessons may apply in Ho Chi Minh City, but also think about what are some of the lessons that might be drawn from, the, from this particular case study and how might we formulate, formulate those uh, in terms of guidance for cities elsewhere. And in that regard, it's useful, I think, to, to begin with a an overview of what are what are some of the basic modes of adaptation, and uh, how might cities begin to think about which modes of adaptation uh, to pursue, and to what extent, and where, etc. And so uh, that's what we look at here briefly, and this is intended to kind of provide a framework uh, both analytically for thinking about how to formulate uh, advice and how to formulate research uh, agendas along this line, but also for some of the discussion that we might have here after the presentation. So I've listed these in terms of six um, modes of adaptation that uh, are not quite mutually exhaustive and exclusive, but I think come fairly close to being both. Uh, and as you can see, the six are adaptive topography, adaptive architecture, adaptive land use, adaptive infrastructure, reactive adaptation, and adaptive lifestyles. So let's take a look at how these, uh, how these work. So the first um, is one that's fairly extensively undertaken, is that of adaptive topography, which is to actually look at changing the topography which, which gives rise to the vulnerabilities uh, of, of inundation. And uh, we see this particular uh, slide is one that's taken from a case study in, in Japan, but I think nicely sort of illustrates some of the basic approach to uh, that of developing levees and dikes which are essentially walls or barriers made of earthen materials or other materials that uh, can surround uh, protected areas, um, uh, polders, I think they're referred to. Um, and of course, this is very common uh, in the Netherlands as well. A number of us who participated in this forum uh, also uh, convened uh, just uh, some weeks before that in the Netherlands. Uh, to, exp to look at some of the uh, kinds of solutions that have, that have been uh, put in place there and have been in, uh, 
worked remarkably well over, over a very long period of time. Uh, so in this regard, um, if we look at the case of Ho Chi Minh City, uh, one of the things that came out from the discussions was that if there was an overall plan to determine what land would be protected and how, and, and, and a method for determining uh, the answer to that question, it, it wasn't clear through three days of discussion, at least to this participant, what, what that was. So there were, there, were, there were a number of strategies in place uh, that could be described in some detailed projects that had been approved, and uh, there were references made here and there to the prime minister has approved this project and that project, but it was difficult to discern what the overall strategy was for, de for determining which, which lands would be preserved and how through this kind of uh, adaptive topography approach. Uh, Mr. John Burroughs, uh, who was one of the participants uh, from the UK, had been uh, just until recently the chief executive officer for Newport Unlimited uh, in uh, Wales, uh, where, they, where they've been dealing with a lot of issues related to uh, water level rise there, uh, pointed out in the context of the forum discussions that when you're dealing with this kind of scenario, really any kind of land use planning needs to take place subsequently to figuring out what the land is, <laughs> where the land is, uh, what, the, what the overall parameters are for, for that uh, preservation. And that, that didn't seem to be, that hadn't seemed to have been done uh, here in the case of Ho Chi Minh City. And so we were finding ourselves in the context of these discussions being asked to comment on strategies for, for example, the Hiep Phuc uh, uh, port, new port city area. And there were other sorts of projects that were sort of being alluded to uh, that were fairly substantial, significant, significant uh, land recovery projects that were being alluded to, but no clear framework for where those um, which projects were going ahead and how it was being determined. So, so this, this clearly, uh, certainly if we look at, again at the case of the Netherlands, is, is, a, is a primary mode of adaptation in the, clay, in the case of uh, inundation. Uh, and so uh, developing uh, sort of modes for thinking about the, you know, essentially a cost-benefit approach to determining what lands to save and where and how and determining the feasibility of that is an important priority. Uh, one of our participants, a former president of PRCUD, Mr. Kor Dekraf, the name actually comes from the profession of looking after the dikes. Uh, so a very, as you can well imagine, a very important profession in the context of the Netherlands, pointed out to the to the to the mayor of Ho Chi Minh City and others at the participants, that it is possible to live below sea level, that they've been doing it in the Netherlands for a very long time. Uh, so it's, uh, this is one of the modes of adaptation uh, that is worth uh, pursuing very systematically. A second mode, and again, these need not be fully uh, mutually exclusive, a second mode of adaptation is to is adaptive architecture. Uh, now, this photo, which comes from the Kanto region in the Mekong, uh, Mekong River uh, Delta, which is not far from Ho Chi Minh City, um, is, is one example. And of course, this house on stilts is clearly a mode of adaptive architecture. But I wouldn't want to convey from this photo the impression that it's only sort of quote unquote primitive uh, uh, sort of architecture that can adapt in this way. That there are, um, uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done in terms of new materials and new, mode, uh, new kinds of architectural innovations that um, enable a population that is resident in vulnerable areas to adapt just in terms of the building structures themselves. And of course, we uh, immediately comes to mind things of questions of mold and how do you, 
uh, how do you um, how how do you adapt? What are the methods? And so you, you can you can imagine that there's a whole research agenda uh, that would be worth pursuing along these levels as well. Now this in the context of Ho Chi Minh City, this kind of adaptation is happening almost default by default in some of the areas like District Six that Professor Little was referring to, which is an older built-up area, which is now increasingly subject to flooding to the point where what was a ground floor is now a floor that is no longer uh, functioning fully as a, as a ground floor. And so in a sense, the, the, the accommodation has moved upstairs, uh, but not through um, sort of pre-envisioned design. And of course, as the city, as the city continues to grow, these Many of these cities, particularly in third world contexts, are often also fast developing cities. I mean, this is one of the issues that we're confronted with here. It's hard enough for us here in the United States, again, looking at the case of New Orleans, to deal with these kinds of issues. In the case of places like Ho Chi Minh City and other cities in third world that are dealing with this, not only do they have the same problems that we're confronting, but in addition to that, they're fast growing cities in many cases with um, lower per capita incomes, less wealth at hand to, to implement solutions, and in many cases, uh, less well-developed institutional structures for uh, responding as well. So let's see. A third mode of adaptation is that of adaptive land use. You know, if an area is going to be subject to flooding, uh, inundation, see, uh, then one mode of adaptation is simply not to not to settle there. Okay, so, the uh, how one determines again this this calls into question which lands are used for what. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is secondary to or subsequent to that prior question of which, what are the lands themselves that are, being, that are being preserved. But these are interactive questions. So uh, this, these kinds of questions arise, of course, not just in the context of sea, letter, sea level rise uh, and flooding, but also in the case of things like uh, uh, settlements, human settlements that locate next to um, any other kinds of hazards, uh, landslides, for example, located next to hills that are subject to landslides. This whole question about whether or not we should even be settling people in such vulnerable areas uh, is a fairly fundamental question, but the question that goes with that is, what are the alternatives? And where else will they live? Because again, many of these places are uh, heavily populated uh, land is, is itself quite scarce, and so there's, there's enormous pressure to settle uh, on any viable bits of land that are available. Keep putting the wrong one. Another adaptive uh, strategy of adaptation has to do with the infrastructure that's in place. Um, this um, sort of advertisement for equipment that I've pulled from the internet uh, is essentially a pumping, pumping facility. So one part of an overall strategy for adaptation may be to uh, make sure if you can't keep the water out, if you can't stop the rain from, from falling, you might at least you know, bring your bail bucket right, and, um, and bail the water out of the protected areas. And these go, um, in particular, where you do have polders, where you do have protected areas, they almost serve as kind of bathtubs, right? You've got, you're keeping the water out, but if water does come in through rainfall or other methods, it's, it's collecting. Uh, so uh, having, having infrastructure that's uh, poised and ready to, to shovel the water out and to bail it outside of the uh, protected habitation areas may be another element of an overall strategy. This fifth 
mode I call reactive adaptation because the fact is, as we've seen here, this photo is from uh, the case of New Orleans, um, what, what tends to happen is if you don't undertake these preventative measures, uh, sufficient preventative measures beforehand, then one may in fact be having to adapt after the fact. Once it's flooded, then adaptation is uh, unavoidable of some sort. And so from an analytical perspective, this is like an insurance question, right? Uh, many people, many households um, have to think about, well, should we, should we get health insurance? And how much health insurance should we get? Should we get insurance uh, for our house, for our home in case of, of fire? And if so, how much should we get? Now, as someone who's trained in economics, uh, my inclination is to think about, well, what is the price? There is some price above which, where, the, where if the premiums are above that price, it's really not worth taking out the insurance. The cost of the insurance is, begins to exceed the expected cost of uh, having to confront a disaster uh, without the uh, protection from the insurance. Now, again, that's just a question of what is that equilibrium price. And in a sense, that same uh, mode of analysis applies here to the case of these kinds of adaptation strategies. It costs a lot of money to build dikes or to put in infrastructure that can pump out water or to move people off land that might or might not be flooded. And those are, in a sense, the kind of insurance premiums that the, that the cities might undertake in order to avoid running into these kinds of ultimate disasters. But to a certain extent, that's a calculated risk. So this, so this whole approach of risk analysis is uh, clearly highly relevant. And now my favorite photo of all, not necessarily the favorite mode of adaptation, but definitely my favorite photo, is that of um, corresponding to adaptive lifestyles. Now, these young guys, I mean, it's raining and pouring in Manila or wherever this uh, photo is. And uh, I mean, you couldn't be cooler than this, right? Hanging out on your raft with your sunglasses, uh, your shirt off. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they are, uh, they are um, enjoying themselves immensely. And, while the photo is intended to be sort of humorous and light, I think there is a, uh, a, 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 a serious point to this, which really relates to the, the one that was made just previously, which is that um, there, we, human beings do have a capacity to adjust to changes in the environment. And so we should think about not just protecting uh, you know, trying to do what we can to protect change from coming, but also to think about how we can adapt, uh, including in adapting our lifestyles, right? Uh, if the weather gets hot, maybe, you know, rather than putting on air conditioning and wearing uh, a suit and a tie, maybe we, let, maybe we turn off the air conditioner and we adapt the way we, uh, way we dress, right? So there are, there, there are different ways of adapting uh, and, and lifestyle is an important part of uh, important part of this, and that should be included in the analysis as well. So, the 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 real message from this is that uh, there are a range of adaptive strategies, and I think that to to the extent that our profession has useful advice to offer to cities that are indeed facing these challenges. It, that, it, that advice should be in the form of helping, uh, providing suitable guidance to these cities as to when, which kinds of adaptive strategies are going to make sense, are, are most likely to be sensible and under what conditions. And uh, I think we've got a long way to go yet, but I think the challenge is fairly well illustrated. Um, here in the case of Ho Chi Minh City, and in terms of the particular recommendations that came out of this forum for the context of Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Professor Blanca will uh, carry us forward. Thank you, 
very much. Okay. Uh, wh what I'm going to do is uh, give you an overview of the two cases that we examined and uh, describe the two areas, the issues, and outline the recommendations that we came up with. I'm going to refer to the port area as the port area uh, because if I mispronounce it, I think our video may become very popular for the wrong reasons. So. Um, Anyhow, uh, first we're going to talk about uh, the port itself. And there were two aspects of the project, as Professor Little, Little explained. Uh, the first one is the relocation of the existing port facilities uh, from the central area in Ho Chi Minh City uh, to new port facilities. And some of them uh, have already been constructed. Uh, I should point out that this new port and industrial area is about 18 kilometers south uh, of the city. And the second part of our uh, concern was the development of a new town adjacent to uh, this new port. And you've seen a, a picture of a map of this. And, and the city itself, uh, the new city, is to have about 180,000 people and may grow two or three times this size, we were told. Uh, and as we as our conversations continued, we realized that the port facility issue was already settled. And there were very good reasons for that. Uh, um, the new port facilities will relieve Ho Chi Minh City from congestion, enable the expansion of the port into a major uh, container cargo uh, port uh, facilities, and it will simulate economic development for that entire region. And so, uh, but let me explain a little bit more about uh, the port area, uh, and specifically the new town. The new town, as you see there, uh, will occupy a, almost uh, five square miles. So this is a large area. Uh, the intent of this uh, development is really to house workers that will work in the new industrial areas and in the port and so on. And uh, one of the major things about this area is that currently there is a large mangrove uh, forest there. And uh, this was one of our concerns very early on. And the other uh, important thing about this, uh, this area is that there is very spongy soil for up to about 40 meters. Uh, the top 40 uh, meters of the soil is very spongy. And, uh, and so the land is subject to subsidence. And of course, it, uh, it means that there are real concerns for new construction there. And so, so some of the issues that uh, became clear in our discussions uh, were things like, for example, should the proposed town be located in such an ecologically sensitive area? And were there alternatives? Some of the local officials, for example, explained that there was plenty of, uh, uh, of areas that were uh, not low-lying to the north of Ho Chi Minh City, but also there was discussion of the fact that uh, there are jurisdictional issues that may prevent Ho Chi Minh City, because it seems Ho Chi Minh City is between two provinces, and so it may prevent Ho Chi Minh City from really expanding uh, towards the north. So again, it brings out uh, some of the, uh, the, the problems that we face throughout the world in dealing with climate change uh, that uh, represent the mismatch between uh, political jurisdictions and the kind of strategies that uh, we need to, uh, we may need to uh, institute to deal with climate change. Uh, another issue that was very important in our discussions uh, was the very character of urban development, if there is to be a new town, and that is, is it going? Uh, should it be low, uh, low rise, or should it be high rise, and so on? 
And, and of course, the other issue that we came back again and again was the extent of, uh, of the uh, preservation of the mangrove forest itself. Uh, we faced other issues regarding uh, the town, uh, and this my colleagues already have alluded to, and that is how can it be protected from sea level rise? And we, and I'll discuss uh, some of the other, uh, in a second or two, uh, some of the efforts. Uh, so we heard uh, quite a number of these. For example, th there is a plan for dikes uh, to protect some of this, but uh, it's not clear how much the residential area will be protected uh, as well. Okay. Faster, I think. So again, one of our key concerns is this issue of, uh, uh, of the vulnerability to sea level rise. And we came back again and again. Uh, the, the local officials were very interested in getting a very concrete answer to, to their question as to whether if they built levees up to a certain height, whether that would protect uh, the uh, new development and so on. But, and, and of course, they, they know uh, the projections for sea level rise for the area. Uh, and they thought, well, if we bring the land up to uh, two or three meters above sea level, will this protect new development? Uh, one of the other concerns we had is, well, if you do bring up land, especially spongy land, uh, up to two or three uh, uh, meters above sea level, will this incre increase the cost of housing and of other types of development? And, uh, and is this sufficient or not? I mean, we're all relying on projections of sea level rise that change. And uh, for example, since the uh, 2007 uh, IPCC study, uh, we have had uh, quite a bit of new studies that indicate that the old predictions for sea level rise were, uh, uh, were very low. And uh, we can expect much higher uh, projections. And so it's not clear uh, to what extent uh, some of these, if, if Ho Chi Minh City's city builds protections up to a certain level, whether they will be sufficient. And also, the issue is not merely uh, the average sea level rise, but you have to think about storm surges and hurricanes and tsunamis and so on for this area that is so vulnerable uh, to these disasters. Okay, let's go on to the recommendations. We have many recommendations, but I've boiled them down uh, for you to, to a few. And we thought uh, that Ho Chi Minh City really should reconsider the, reloca the location of the new town. And it should do so after a very thorough uh, study that should be conducted by a multi-agency task force. What we found was that there, there were many studies, but primarily the studies were done by uh, engineers, uh, water engineers, soil engineers, and they were very heavy on engineer solutions. Um, and, and the different uh, the different task forces or agencies actually didn't seem to be talking to each other too much. And so we thought that it it needed to be a consolidated task force and, and uh, that the task force needed to do an integrated analysis of all of these aspects. One of the uh, important things that we found is that there was really very little consideration for financial and uh, economic issues. Um, it's not clear how the local agencies, how the port, or how the city, or even the national government uh, was going to uh, be able to um, to recover some of the costs of the infrastructure that that it was developing. We thought also that a cost-benefit analysis 
as Professor Hikela explained, was really very necessary to compare the different adaptation strategies. Um, and uh, uh, the, the final point was that if a new town is to be uh, located in this area, then Ho Chi Minh City needs to consider a smaller population than is planned for. And definitely, if you go back to our, uh, to our slide there, you see the green areas there in that slide. Uh, it's, uh, I, I forget exactly, maybe my colleagues remember, it was what, 10 or 15 percent of the area or something like that that would be preserved as open space. And uh, we thought that definitely we needed a much higher proportion to be preserved if the plans were to, be, uh, to go forward. Now I'm going to turn to District 6. All right, and you've had a bit of an introduction to this already, and maybe I can skip some of this, but um, we were very much interested in two aspects of this case, both the flooding and the redevelopment uh, of this existing uh, low-income neighborhood with a population of about 215,000 people and another 100,000 expected in the next decade or two. This is an area, as Professor Little explained, that has a long history of settlement with uh, uh, a traditionally uh, Chinese settlement. Um, and many, continuously, uh, it has been uh, the location for ma many rural migrants and continues uh, to be so. It is pretty much low rise, uh, from one to three stories, and very little green area. We were told that 98% of this district uh, was covered with impervious seal surfaces. So very little opportunities for water to drain once it's flooded. The location itself, as Professor Little explained, is very low lying. It's one meter above sea level and subject to flooding at high tide and from rainfall. And uh, it has these two major canals that, of course, flood uh, uh, that cross the neighborhood. One of these canals, I think I have a picture of these. I forget exactly how to do this. Well, one of these canals pictured up there is a major canal that uh, was uh, a freight route uh, from the Macon uh, area. Uh, upland and, and was very important historically uh, for moving uh, goods uh, to, the, to the port area in Ho Chi Minh City. Before 1990, we were, t we were told this area was inundated about two, three hours per, per day during the rainy season. But now uh, the area is inundated the whole day. So obviously two things may be uh, playing here. Uh, one climate change, but also the fact that uh, the other surrounding neighborhoods may be developing more and more and more sealed surfaces. And, uh, and the final point, that this district is the lowest point of a slope in Ho Chi Minh City. So it's the repository of uh, waters from all the other neighborhoods. So it's a major drainage basin for Ho Chi Minh City. And so our concerns were uh, whether the flooding problem is being addressed in an integrated or systemic way. What should be the character of development? And we had a lot of discussions about, well, low rise or high rise and so on. And we discovered also in our discussions that this is not an either or type of proposition. Uh, there is a middle road, right? There is medium rise, which I think has a lot of uh, advantages, certainly for Ho Chi Minh City, but uh, for other uh, cities as well. Uh, the other issue, uh, given that uh, we were told that 98% of the area was uh, covered with impervious surface, 
how can new uh, development, new redevelopment of the area increase green areas for both natural drainage, but also for the heat island effect? We were told, not necessarily, uh, not really in our symposium, but uh, from uh, another official, that the heat island effect uh, was really very major in Ho Chi Minh City, and that the city needed to uh, uh, to focus on this as well. And so the issue of increasing green area, of increasing the green infrastructure for the city is very important, both for drainage and for uh, te the temperature increase that we expect uh, to um, to occur with uh, with climate change. Another major issue again is the institutional mechanisms. Uh, how can they, they be put into place uh, to pay for the public works or the taking of land uh, for flood protection and so on. Um, and another uh, uh, final issue that I want to uh, um, bring to your attention is this issue of community engagement. And uh, how, how do we get uh, people to be aware of the problems, to be part of the solutions, and uh, so on? And, and, and this was very important because uh, a number of local experts explained to us uh, that, um, that the local government had engaged the, uh, the local population in a cleanup of the canals rather recently. And of course, you know, everyone uh, cleaned up the canal, but within two days or so, garbage be began to be dumped again. And you probably could see from some of our previous slides how much garbage uh, there was in these canals. So they, they were uh, wondering how can we uh, really be effective in getting the population to, uh, to be involved and, and to be consistently uh, agents of, of change in this area as well. Okay. All right, just to uh, recap, the seal surfaces, very, uh, uh, a very important issue in the redevelopment uh, of this uh, part. And the urban form issues were very interesting. Uh, one of the uh, uh, professors of architecture and urban planning at, at the university there explained how this was an area that had continuous facades on the streets, no side yards at all, so that when, uh, uh, when flooding occurs, there is no way uh, for the water to move out of the streets and so on. And so again, uh, as Professor Hikela explained, uh, this is uh, a kind of uh, strategy that will be very important uh, to deal uh, with problems in this uh, district. The canals, again, could be a great asset, but they were full of garbage. And how do we engage residents? Heritage, uh, the old Chinese uh, uh, neighborhoods and uses and history and so on could be an asset, but they have been disappearing over time. Uh, and then this issue of the infrastructure. We did hear quite a number of local officials talking about uh, new infrastructure for sewage um, and so on, but not clear uh, whether the different measures address all of the sources of inundation. And again, the character of development. Okay, this is the last slide. All right. Our recommendation a major recommendation, again, was to, uh, uh, for Ho Chi Minh City to adopt a comprehensive integrated uh, approach, and in particular to focus on uh, financial management and community engagement, which were missing from the plans that they explained to us. Uh, we thought that uh, the city needed to take uh, an urban resilience type of approach, a layered approach to flooding that would incorporate multiple strategies for adaptation, as Professor Hikola explained, from uh, adaptive architecture to the structural solutions of uh, 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 new uh, sewage systems and um, uh, the broadening of the canals and 
as well as the green infrastructure solutions, increasing green space and ensuring that uh, they are interconnected and so on. We thought as well that Ho Chi Minh City needed to incorporate heritage and culture in the revitalization of the plants and to incorporate the canals as main revitalization corridors, just as Seoul has done with its riverfront recently, or Portland, for example, in the U.S. Okay, uh, I just want to uh, make some concluding remarks to bring it back to, uh, to uh, the opening of our presentations. And, and here I want to point out that the function of an expert panel is really to provide an outside view for the local experts. Um, and it's exploratory. It's not an alternative to an to in-depth uh, consultant or staff research at all, but it's really an opportunity to provide advice on the direction of their studies, to identify opportunities and challenges that uh, the local experts may have missed, uh, to provide uh, to, to identify gaps in their studies, and to provide examples of how it, it has been done. Uh, these problems may have been dealt successfully in, in other parts of the world. I thought it was a, a very exciting uh, roundtable uh, from the standpoint of, of the participants because we had real-time, uh, real problem um, issues. We were interacting with local officials uh, and uh, the experience of the of the team of experts was really terrific for us, I think, because we had people from Singapore, from the Netherlands, from the UK, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, who were real experts, had real expertise in a lot of these issues and so on. And um, it, it was the kind of experience that uh, you could never get from a research monograph or any kind of academic publication. Uh, and I thought it was extremely valuable and, of course, we all hope that our local hosts uh, uh, found the experience useful as well. And thank you very much. And, of course, we want to open this up for questions. Well, thank you very much, panelists. I think this is the problem uh, kind of scratching the surface uh, of this new invitation for the cities sort of your sense of, you know, the depth of the issues that are involved. Um, normally, we have a, uh, a discussion in a situation like that, but the discussion could be here. So you folks are the discussants now. Uh, but before before I, uh, I have the question, I wanted to do a couple of things. One, I introduce uh, Michelle Buckmeyer, the graduate student who is helping me uh, putting together the seminar. The one thing I've done this year, we're, we're getting uh, these uh, presentations taped, so they'll be on the, and Ben at the back is in charge of that, which will be on our website uh, and available. And the other thing I've done, uh, again, the initiative of Michelle, we now have a uh, blog site, um, Urban Growth, you, and then so if you're not able to have all of your answers on that time run time, we don't get to ask you a question, you can certainly use the blog site to continue the discussion and questions and so forth. So with that, first question. Hi, Stephen Hubbard, uh, um, I was As you were showing the slides, um, I was worried about whether they were considering protecting the urban areas or surrounding uh, the rivers. And I was thinking of some of the papers that I think Dr. White from the University of Chicago has written showing that you know, more money spent on flood control by surrounding the rivers greater damage because of 500 year floods. Um, I don't know if they have, I can't remember their tropical storms or, or uh, cyclones that come through so I'm not certain what year is it's very worrisome. Um, but I was wondering if they could use the mangrove sucks uh, uh, swamp as a tourist attraction versus something down. <clears throat> can I can I suggest we take a, a number of questions because and then we can sort of uh, field those as a as a group because otherwise you're listening to us the whole time and we don't get to listen to you all. Yeah. Why did you follow? Uh, is 
that you should uh, introduce yourself who you are quickly. Okay, Jose Perez Juan, uh, uh, these uh, students, and uh, my question is that you told that there are some students from other countries that think that uh, the problem that you mentioned about the ocean is the problem of all the um, uh, mega cities in the um, developing countries. They have kind of natural disaster, face na natural disaster. And, um, as far as I know, I was working on Tehran uh, about the earthquake and the problem of earthquake that may happen in these cities. But uh, seems that there are no uh, way to get rid of it because um, the problem is that the lots of population has gathered in these cities and cannot move them easily out of these cities. And I don't know if there is any example, um, um, any good example that if they have done anything, because I remember that New York has the same problem and that, that, that some people have answered this question that they should move from those cities because we cannot do anything. We cannot have enough soil to uh, pour over there and get the land come uh, uh, um, uh, up uh, enough. So, other questions? Uh, Ellen on the journey, PhD. Uh, I was wondering if this, in the discussion of the new development of the new city, there was any discussion about uh, energy flows or uh, more uh, carbon aware uh, model of development? possible to make the canals a little steeper through dredging? Or could that fix some of the problems? Yeah. Do you have it up there? No, no, but okay. I'm Dalmire. I'm a professor. So I have to ask you guys why this seems to be a problem of incrementalism. <laughs> it's developed incrementally. And are the solutions incremental too? Or do you need to somehow really jolt people out of their path, off the path, and into a whole new approach? And I, I don't know that, how do you do that? And I, don't, I didn't get a sense from the presentation. I saw everything being incremental, incremental. And I don't see, there's so much inertia. I don't see how you move people. OK, we, we have to take this because you're five. You have enough to. <laughs> That's why we have pens. But, yeah, well, we, 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 maybe why don't yeah. we uh, respond a little bit and then take, yeah. some, yeah. more. take some more? Um, anybody All right. care to jump in? Somebody sure, sure, I'll jump in. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, actually, I'll, I'll start with uh, Professor Meyer's question uh, and then tie in a couple of the other ones where, where I know something. Um, I mean, one of the problems with this is, uh, as far as taking a thermonuclear as opposed to an incremental kind of solution, let's come up with the big fix all at once. The question immediately becomes, well, what's the problem we're fixing? I mean, we have estimates from, let me see, we have estimates from flat earthers who say there is no climate change. Uh, and then we go up to people who talk about tens of meters by the end of the century. Uh, how do you plan for something between zero and, and 50 feet of, of sea level rise? What exactly do you do? And I think, unfortunately, because of the uncertainty and because of the time scale that this is going to play out over, we really do need to look at incremental kinds of solutions hopefully stopping some of the, the less wise things. Uh, the, really, the new port city is probably a pretty bad idea. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll, I, I don't want to spend time going off in that digression. But I think from a standpoint of, of what do you do from both a planning and a hardware standpoint, I, I think the, the infrastructure piece, a uh, gentleman over here said that, you know, are you adding to the damage by building protection? Well, uh, you certainly can be. I mean, one of the things we learned from New Orleans was that we protected a lot of land. 
So we had a lot of development on that land, and then we found out it wasn't quite as protected as we thought it was. Those are all dangers, but I think as we adopt a strategy, we're going to have to do things that build on each other and hopefully not get caught in a cul-de-sac where, oh, gee, we went down this road, but this isn't going to work in the future, so we're going to have to back out and do something else. Uh, and until we really have a better sense of the magnitude of what we're facing and the, the time frame that we're operating in, it, it's hard to not take an incremental approach. You know, the sea level is going to rise 50 feet. Well, does that happen in 10 years? Does that happen in two centuries? Two centuries, I'll, I'll let the future deal with that, but if it's going to happen within the time frame that we can deal with it, I think we need to, we need to address what we can and leave to the future to address what they're going to have to. Okay, I, I want to follow up on that. Uh, I, I think that, in a real sense, it, it's not all piecemeal. I mean, for example, while we were there, we noticed all that uh, there was so much uh, street, new, new uh, streets um, and sidewalks and so on in the new district, I mean, in this uh, District uh, 6. So, and that's happening throughout the city as a whole. So they're basically sealing the city more and more, but they could have done it differently. And so it, that, that's not, it's true from a, a whole system's perspective, that may be piecemeal because we're only dealing with street <coughs> infrastructure and sewage and so on, uh, I mean, and, and drainage, but it's still pretty uh, systemic. They could have done it differently. They could have, uh, uh, you know, made the streetscape much more pervious and things like that. So there are opportunities for more systemic approaches to these things. Uh, and for example, when we talked about increasing the green space and uh, the opportunity for uh, redeveloping the areas around the canal and the dredging and the uh, widening of the canals, all of that could be incorporated into a kind of green infrastructure uh, system for the city that could be very important uh, in the future, both for drainage and for temperature. So yes, in a real sense, we talked about many strategies, but some of these are system-oriented type of strategies, right? Yeah, well, but we had I'll a just number add of other questions. One, just add one thing, right. I'm, I'm looking at sort of the list of questions, and I think Professor Meyer's question has elicited a uh, number of our responses because I think it's a, it's a fairly comprehensive and important question. And uh, I think that to a certain extent the answer is yes, there's some incrementalism involved. On the other hand, uh, I, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that the city is continuing to evolve. And so incremental changes that are put into place now by bit can shape the uh, direction of that evolution. And so these uh, incremental changes uh, can begin to accumulate over time and can begin to make a real difference, particularly if, they're, if the increments are put together. Um, if they may be incremental chronologically, but if they're put together in a more kind of comprehensive way of thinking and in an overall comprehensive strategy, then it might add up to more than just uh, um, a bunch of bits. Okay, but there were other questions. Other questions? Yes, we, there were other questions. Steve asked a question and, and, and uh, Professor Little uh, responded to it a bit. I, I mean, the, the fact is we did notice that the, uh, many of the strategies that the local officials uh, have been working on are, are very engineering type of solutions and, uh, and th this is why we pretty much our recommendations have to do with integrating the work that they've been doing. They, they aren't really talking to each other for the most part. So yes, there are some people who are, uh, you know, in charge of the canal works and so on, but they may not be thinking about, well, what will be the uh, side effects of doing such a thing? And so this, this was why we had such a great emphasis on uh, more integrated type of analysis. 
get it. But then I've forgotten the other two. May, may I ask a quick question? <clears throat> and I think it's been raised on this But isn't there kind of a larger regional uh, uh, approach that must be looked at? regionally, even the national Uh, one third of the country is underwater. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, it's not just the cities, but it's also the the hinterland, the system of rivers and tributaries and canals and wetlands and the entire regional ecosystem must play a major role in, 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 in care. I mean you make we make these only one uh, surface is more pervious, but the water has to go somewhere eventually. Uh, I mean, I'm probably water in Vietnam, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, ability to, the water level is pretty high already, so, so it has to be drained somehow in a larger landscape. Was that part of the discussion at all? Should we gather more questions as well to include in this uh, next next batch? Yes. Yeah, um, five, five minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Philip Armstrong. I'm a uh, First, I would like to uh, uh, salute you as a group for going into such a, uh, a um, challenging situation and not you know, choosing something more controlled. Uh, what I was wanted to ask you was, uh, did you feel like uh, they, uh, the, you know, the city, the mayor and so forth, uh, were able to incorporate uh, the uh, concerns that you had into their into their uh, agenda for moving the developments ahead. I was a little bit curious about the gentleman's question up front regarding the dredging of the canals. If you could address that more specifically, maybe that revitalization that you talked about, right? As a whole. Well. And maybe a last one, then we're just about. Oh, yes. I was just uh, Senator Mary, um, and I was just curious on the where you discuss including community engagement. If there is currently any level of community engagement right now for planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me jump in quickly to, to respond um, uh, at least in the first round to some of these questions. With respect to the larger overview, yes, that did enter into the discussions quite a bit. Uh, part of it, part of the questions, one of the questions that arose was just having to do with what is the carrying capacity of, Ho Chi, of this Ho Chi Minh, of this metropolitan region as a whole, and is it inevitable that that growth must take place there, and what is the overall national strategy? And so that that definitely was part of the. Uh, discussion, the no clear, no clear answer, but it was, it was, it was figured in. In terms of Ho Chi Minh City's response, actually, um, I'm just preparing to send the report to them this week. Uh, it's just been, it's just been finalized. But I think overall, I mean, this is something that we've wrestled with in these PRCUD forums uh, a fair bit. Is we have the forum, we have a lot of discussions, we prepare a report, and then we move on. And so the a question that arises is, well, what? What, what is the follow-up? And I think a large part of it does indeed depend upon the cities themselves. I mean, to what, it, what are the motivations for holding this? I mean, they, come, they, they spend a fair bit of money on putting these kinds of uh, forums together. They're inviting experts from around the world, paying for them to come in, and taking a lot of their own time and effort to do this. So presumably there's some commitment, some, earn, some genuine reason to learn. Now, part of it's publicity, part of it's um, um, you know, sort of, in a sense, politics, in, not in, a, not in a, a pejorative sense of the term, but there are a lot of political considerations and payoffs for, for, for conducting these kinds of events. But my sense is, both in the case of Ho Chi Minh City and in other forums that I've organized, that uh, the, they're genuine. I mean, they are looking... To, uh, to, to get answers, to find out what's going on elsewhere in the world, to what are, what are other places that are dealing with the same kinds of issues, what are some ideas. I think the one thing that um, might be the case is that to, to a certain extent they were asking questions that have very specific answers. You know, how, 
how many meters should this dike be? And, and those are kinds of questions that perhaps they don't get satisfactory responses from because this, this kind of group think is better for, for uh, providing a wide circle around the range of topics that need to be considered in terms of formulating a comprehensive strategy. In terms of the dredging question, we didn't mean to uh, overlook that the first time. Yes, dredging is clearly a part of that because the canals provide an important means by which accumulated water can uh, run off and to the extent that those fill up uh, then then dredging can help but one part of you know the the flip side of dredging is not to be filling them up with garbage in the first place um, and it's it's it was really astounding none of the pictures here did justice to just the shocking amount of garbage and filth that was going into these canals that were right through the hearts of the city, particularly in District 6. I mean, they were filthy and smelly and, you know, on a hot, fetid day. I mean, it was really, um, you know, and these are the people who live right next to them and they're throwing their own garbage and waste right into it and living right next to it. And so then going along and thinking about, well, we need to dredge them because the water isn't flowing through. Um, you know, the, it shows that the, the underlying problems are much more complex, and part of that deals with the socioeconomic um, composition of the area. These, this District 6 is a poorer area that, is, that serves as the location for a lot of in-migrants from elsewhere in the region and in the country who are coming in, establishing themselves, getting a foothold in the city, and then moving on. So many of them don't feel this... Uh, the commitment to the area, which relates partly to the question on community engagement as well. It's clear that the, that the city has been making efforts because to, to engage. For example, the, the, the campaign to clean up the canals uh, is, is a very good example. Um, but they themselves feel somewhat frustrated in terms of, uh, because they were the ones who were reporting to the, to the forum, you know, the, we're running into this kind of problem, this kind of problem, and so so this this general level of community engagement and awareness and how and what is broadly termed in the literature as sort of socio environmental relations is a key part of this. I just want to the lady who had the question about or the comment about makeshift structures and mega cities. Uh, that's really an issue that, that I think is, is far broader than just climate change and sea level. The, the problem that I've seen in my limited exposure and, and most of my time has been spent in the States and it's very hard to compare socioeconomic issues you see in the U.S. with socioeconomic issues you see in the developing world. The, the levels of poverty are vastly different and I think one of the things that the developing world really needs to figure out is how do we, or the developed world, how do we help the developing world house their vulnerable populations in places that we don't have what's going on in, in Pakistan. We, we don't have what happened in Haiti after the earthquake. Uh, it always turns out that yes, there are solutions, but these very often are people that are patching their housing together from bits and pieces that other people have thrown away. And, and they occupy the most vulnerable areas where, where no one will build for economic reasons because they're at risk. And I certainly don't know the answer to that question, but I mean that is probably going to be one of the major challenges the developing world faces in this century because those are the populations that are growing very fast People are flocking to these cities and places where whatever hazards were there before are only magnified by the fact that you increase the population by multiples and putting that many more people at risk and you know taking the we hope it doesn't happen approach is, is not a good answer. But that's I mean that's really a fundamental question and in this region in particular, so many areas are going to be impacted by just sea level rise storm surge, the change in weather patterns, uh, that there really ought to be countries in the region working together, which was one of the recommendations we did leave behind in Ho Chi Minh City, was that they start to establish regional partnerships. I just want to follow up on that. I think this issue of relocation of vulnerable settlements 
it is one that we haven't paid much attention to in academia. But if climate change in certain parts of the world brings about recurrent disasters, we will have to pay more attention to, to it. Uh, I should say that uh, some sensitive efforts have been made, for example, in Latin America, uh, to deal with favelas, for example, in Brazil, uh, with uh, the shanty towns that are located on uh, vulnerable slopes and so on and are subject to flooding and mudslides and things like that. And, and, and that's an interesting uh, approach to take that, that basically does provide relocation opportunities for people uh, and it provides options, for example. Uh, and, and it's not just, well, uh, here we, we think that you are in a vulnerable po uh, part of town and therefore you're going to have to move or you have to go somewhere but we don't really, we're not going to provide any type of help at all. So it's, it, it's something that is beginning to be developed, uh, but for the, the larger scale, whole s settlement relocation, I think it's uh, an important area of research because it involves, uh, in, in developed countries at least, it involves property rights and all kinds of issues and so on. Uh, I, I want I one we're final we're thing, almost, I guess. We're, we're quite a bit over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, 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 I do think that uh, Ho Chi Minh City will take seriously our recommendations because they were, they're very serious about climate change and secondly because a lot of their new infrastructure and so on, the money comes from the World Bank and the World Bank, at least one part of the World Bank, is very much interested in incorporating some ecological approaches. Uh, to economic development, and uh, I think for that reason, we, we may see some uh, more sensitive solutions to these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again on September 14th. Right.